There's a lot of components related to geometry. Oftentimes there are an assortment of figures and shapes that are identifiable based on characteristics. And also when we're calculating certain units of measurement, we have certain values that we need to place on the unit of measurement to indicate what type of measurement we're recording. So question number one, the first one asks us to match the calculations with the unit of measurement. So the first option was a perimeter. All a perimeter is, is the distance around a figure, no matter how many sides it is. So to find the perimeter, you're just adding up all of the sides. Because all you're doing is adding a length and a length and a length and a length, it is a plain unit of measurement. So there's gonna be just a plain unit. So unit, centimeter, feet, etc. No extra value or exponent on the unit of measurement because it is a straight one-dimensional measurement. When we have a area, that is looking to figure out how much space is inside of our figure. And the spaces that we're looking at are two-dimensional. It's length by width. And so that's why these units of measurement have a square on them because they are a foot times a foot, a centimeter by a centimeter to show that there is more space than just a linear value. The circumference is related to circles and it is the perimeter of a circle. Any perimeter is always a one dimensional space so it is a plain unit of measurement. Uh, volume only exists in three dimensional shapes where you have a length, a width, and a height or depth. You just have to have three different units of measurement. And because you're multiplying three different sides by each other, each one of those sides has a unit of measurement on it, maybe a centimeter, feet, whatever. And so that's why these units are always cubed to indicate that three different sides were being multiplied together to get whatever number value is on that unit of measurement. And then for the surface area, that is also going to be on a three-dimensional uh, figure, but it's only looking at the side of it, the outside of it. If you're looking at a tissue box, it's not asking you to find out how much area is inside of it, that's volume. It's asking you to say how much space is being covered all of the way around this figure. And because you're only taking the length and width of each of the sides, it is a two-dimensional unit of measurement. So whatever you calculate all of the sides to be, that would be a unit squared because you're only looking at a length times a width. The next question asks you to match the different geometrical shapes to their definitions. So a prism is a solid 3D ge geometric figure whose two end faces, top and bottom, are similar and whose sides are parallelograms. So again, we'll back to this. This is a rectangular prism. So no matter what, if I'm looking at it from here, top and bottom are the same and each of these parallel are parallelograms. We're used to parallelograms not having um, 90 degree corners, but parallelograms can have 90 degree corners uh, because they are just, they have opposite parallel sides. So this corner is, this corner is opposite to that one, same angle, same angle. So parallelogram. Okay, uh, perpendicular is at a 90 degree angle to a given line, plane, or surface. So that means if you have a horizontal line, your, put it here, your perpendicular line runs straight up from that, creating a perfect T where you have these 90 degree corners on either side that you're looking at. It can be perpendicular here, perpendicular here, but it's this perfect squaring corner. A trapezoid is a quadrilateral with only one pair of parallel sides. So I could have something like this, where this side and this side are running the same direction, but this side does not have accompanying parallel side on that side. You can have them go out like this. Trapezoids are pretty flexible in how they're designed, um, but it's, again, just a pairing. There's only one pair of parallel sides, whereas a lot of our other shapes have one pair of parallel lines, two pairs of parallel lines. So, 
Um, a kite is a quadrilateral, and all quadrilateral is is a figure with four line segments making it up, where um, with two pairs of sides, and the pairs are of different lengths to one another. So I might have those look the same, so we'll put a mark there, and these are the same, but these two are not the same. So they're, they're different from the adjacent line to it, okay? But it has a pair, but that pair is different to the adjacent pair in length. Uh, parallelogram is a four-sided rectilinear figure with opposite sides parallel. Internal angles don't have to measure 90 degrees. They can, hence the reason a square and a rectangle can be a parallelogram, but squares and rectangles can't always be a parallelogram if those corners aren't 90 degrees. So, okay. A quadrilateral is just a four-sided figure having all straight lines. A rhombus is a parallelogram with opposite equal acute angles and opposite uh, obtuse angles, and each of the four sides is the same. So it's basically like a tilted over square. So if I have this, okay, kind of looks like a diamond. This corner, this angle here is over 90 degrees, and its opposite angle is over 90 degrees. This angle is less than 90 degrees, this angle is the same as that because it's opposite. So these are our obtuse angles and these are our acute angles. And all of the lines are the same length. So basically, if all of the lines are the same length, but it doesn't have 90 degree corners, it's a rhombus. A rectangle is has all four sides, um, Okay, four-sided figure with two pairs of equal length sides with four right angles, but adjacent sides are not the same. So again, adjacent just means next to. So that means I have two set of parallel lines with 90 degree corners in each of them, and the lines adjacent are not the same. So unlike the, the kite where the, the adjacent sides there next to each other had been the same, but then lower down they weren't, um, that's kind of the difference between the kite and, and the rectangle. Okay, and then a polygon is just a flat figure with at least three straight lines with each end of the line segment only touching one other. So we had done a task where um, we couldn't have this be a polygon because this line here, this line segment here, touches a line here and touches a line here. So it's breaking that rule of only being able to touch one other line. If I took out, if I took out this diagonal line, every line segment is only touching one other line segment at the end, so that therefore is a polygon. Our question after that says, if the area of a rectangle is 11 and one side is 3 and 2 thirds, what is the other side? Well, we know that area is length times width equaling the area. So I know that the total area is 11. And how do I get that? 3 and 2 thirds, we'll say W. We don't know whether that's length or width. We don't really care. Well, I know because there's multiplication involved here which also means I'm going to be doing some division. I can't have it as a mixed number because fractions are snobs when they're multiplying and dividing and only like to work with other fractions. And this whole number three is throwing that for a loop. So we have to convert this to an improper fraction. Three times three is nine plus two gives me 11. So this is 11 thirds W equals 11. Well, I need to figure out 11 thirds times something equals 11. What's that going to be? Well, in order to solve that, I need to divide 11 thirds out. Because anytime we have a, we'll call this a coefficient, times some variable, whatever operation is occurring in the original problem, I have to do the opposite of it to get it off of there. So instead of multiplying by 11 thirds, I need to divide by 11 thirds. So when I divide by 11 thirds, divide by 11 thirds, I have 11 here divided by 11 thirds, which means I copy, I dot, and I flip. And again, for 
fractions are snobs and only like to work with other fractions and multiplication and division. Oh wait, I see 11 up here and 11 down there. That means I can cross cancel. Whoop. Leaving me with a three over a one, which is just a three. So W, our missing dimension has to be three. The trapezoid. Okay, so the formula for finding the area of a trapezoid is on the question. And don't worry, any areas or any formulas for calculating will be on the test, so you don't have to panic and try to memorize them. Uh, I had to re refresh my memory on what the area of a trapezoid was because I never have to find it. All right, so it is A plus B divided by 2, then multiplied by H. And in a trapezoid, the top line, the top is A, the bottom is B, and then we have height dissecting through the center of it so we know how tall it is. So we just need to plug in our dimensions. It has 7, 15, and 9. So if I go 7 plus 15, I get 22. Oh, well, over 2, I get 22 over 2, which equals 11. I now have 11 here that I'm going to be multiplying by height, which here it says is 9. So I have 99, and these were meters. And because it's area, I know it is two-dimensional, so I have meters squared. Okay, so how could you, switching to a different set of area, looking at the area of a parallelogram and the area of a triangle. And so how can you use the area of a parallelogram to find the area of a triangle? Well, the two formulas are really, really similar, just you have to take one extra step in the triangle, okay? Because when we have a parallelogram, Parallelograms, to calculate their area, you have to take the height times the base because this extra spot can just flip, switch over to fill in this gap and create a rectangular shape, okay? So say if I have, um, we'll just go with 8 and, and 10, okay? So the area of a parallelogram is calculated by multiplying base times height. So I'd be 10 times 8, which is 80. Well, parallelograms are twice as much as a triangle. If I go through here, same thing, and I dissected that, and I need to find out, oh, well, what's the area of this triangle? If I notice, it's dividing my parallelogram in half, so this triangle is half of the dimension of a parallelogram, so I just cut it in two, and I find the area of a triangle. So the parallelograms and triangles have the same formula, except triangle takes the parallelogram's value and cuts it in half. Okay, uh, I guess the, the answer you're looking for is you have to multiply the base and the height to find the area, which we did in parallelogram. We have to do it in the triangle as well. And then you have to divide it by two to find the area of the triangle. So it has the same foundation, base times height, but then the triangle has base times height cut in half. So, similar foundation, just an extra step on the triangle. Weird shaped polygons and finding perimeter and area. All right, if we have... And just remember, don't trust proportions. Just because one measurement says it's that big and says it's two, and the next measurement is that big and it says ten, you're like, well, that doesn't look right. It's just numbers. So don't rely on, on things staying proportional. So this says it's three and a half. These are centimeters. Four centimeters. Seven centimeters. And three centimeters. Okay. Well, to find the perimeter, we have to add up all of the lines of the exterior polygon. Well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six sides, but I only have four units of measurement. That means I need to find what the missing units are. And one of the things is, if I know that this distance across is seven centimeters, I know that this distance is also seven centimeters. I, I know that this dimension here is three. 
I do not know what this dimension is. I'll label it as A. Okay? Well, if this total distance is supposed to be the same as this parallel distance, if I have 3, what's the missing value to make the same as 7? It's got to be 4. So I can label A now with 4 centimeters. All right? And finally, I don't know this bottom dimension, but I know that this line here and this horizontal line here stretch the same distance as this. I kind of think of it as a whole spaghetti noodle and a spaghetti noodle that got broken up and set apart. It's the same length of spaghetti noodle, just in two different pieces. So if I have four here and three and a half here, that means this total distance here is that value added together. So it's seven and a half centimeters. Now I know all of the dimensions of my shape and I can add them together. So if I have these two are seven, this is seven, my vertical lines add up to 14. If this is seven and a half and this adds up to seven and a half, I have a total of 15 from my horizontal lines to get a total of 29 centimeters for the perimeter. Now to find the area, the easiest way is to take this oblong shape and cut it into different pieces that I can calculate the area of using the standard length times width. So, clean this up. Okay, so this was seven and a half, this was three. So I can just, if I want to, I can turn this into a square here because I know this length is four and this length is four. Length times width, four times four is gonna give me 16 centimeters squared. Now I'm gonna do the same thing down here. I know I now have a length times width shape here. I know one dimension is three and the other is seven and a half. When I multiply those two together, I get 22.5 centimeters squared. So then I just add up my two different areas to find the total area my shape takes up. So if I have 22 and a half plus 16, I have half and eight and three, 38 centimeters squared, because again, it's area, you have to square the unit of measurement. If uh, the directions ask you not to label the, the unit of measurement, leave it off, because Canvas might not recognize it as an answer. All right, the next one is a very funky shape, but it's good, it's a good thing. So this shape is also asking us to find the perimeter and the area of it. There are a lot of different line segments to it and missing values. So I have one, two, I don't know what this one is, so I'm going to label it as A, so I don't forget it's there. One, uh, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know this dimension, so we'll call this B, and I don't know this dimension, so I'm going to call this C. So I know I have three missing dimensions that i got to figure out before I can even figure out what the perimeter is. Well, I see that down here is four. These are parallel lines, so they are going to have the same unit of measurement. So that means A, I can replace it with four. As I move around, I don't know what this is. But if I look at it, this length and this length is the same distance across as these three lines. So four and 12 means I have a total distance across of 16. Well, I know that four of this was there, six of this was here. What's the missing dimension to give me a total length of 16? Well, four plus six is 10. So that means this dimension needs to be six to get me to that 16. So B, I'm gonna replace with a six. And then here I have C. I know that the total distance down is going to be 10. I know that two of this is already accounted for, so I'll take that out. I know that, well, this whole side is six, but it went down past it. So that means if I go, if this length is two, right here is also two. So that means this length here is four, okay? So if I have two and four, what am I gonna to add to that to make this missing dimension? Well, two plus four is six, and I need four more to get to 10. Okay, 
So now I have all of my sides accounted for. And again, this, this one was a little bit of a confusing spot, I understand. We're trying to figure out how big this is, and it goes to here. So we mark that, and we because of this line here, we knew that this much was two. If this total distance is six, and I already had two of it accounted for, this had to be four to let me know what that gap space was. Okay, all of my sides are accounted for, so I can add them up. I have a 10 and a, I don't need, I don't wanna accidentally add that in there again, uh, a four and a four for eight, um, a line of two and 12. Actually, I'm gonna list these separately so I make sure I'm not dropping a number because that is really easy to do and it will give you a wrong answer, especially as I put in all these extra measurements. So I was figuring it out, so six and two and six and four and four. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lengths here. Let me double check that I accounted for all of my lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, okay, I can add. Uh, let's see, we'll go four and two for six plus the ten. I now have sixteen and I have six and six for twelve. Plus 12 gives me 24, okay? And six and four gives me 10, plus two and four for 16, okay? So now I'll add those up. Six and four is 10, plus six is 16. One, two, three, four, five. So I have a perimeter of 56 units because it's not labeled as a dimension, we just call it units. So Perimeter of this shape is 56. So perimeter is 56. Now similar to what we did on the last question, to find the area of this, I can't do it all at once. So the easiest way is to make different quadrilaterals, find the areas of those, and then add them together. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this up here. I have a dimension of six and a dimension of six. So that means this is 36 units squared. Here I have a length or a length and a width. So I'm going to close that up and say 10 times four is 40 units squared. And here we found out that this was six and we had calculated that this dimension here was four because four and two is six. To get 10, this has to be 4. So I have 4 times 6 to get 24 units squared. So now I can add all of these up. Uh, 36 and 24 gives me 60. And 60 plus 40 is going to give me 100 units squared. Or in this case, we'll spell the whole thing out. So units squared. All right, so don't get overwhelmed. Break something unfamiliar and confusing into smaller, more manageable, familiar shapes so that you're using a process you're comfortable with. Okay. The next question with exponents. Have us looking at 10 to the negative three times, or no, sorry, plus, that makes a big difference, plus 10 to the 3. And what does this equal? You've seen this question a few times on previous tests. Uh, I think usually it was either equaling 0 or equaling 1. I want you to calculate what it is this time yourself. Negative exponents do not mean a negative number. They mean a reciprocal, a less than a whole. So to turn this, to evaluate this negative and get the negative off of the exponent, I have to flip my 10. So instead of being 10 as a whole number base, it becomes 10 in fraction form. So 1 and 10 to the third power, then I evaluate, well, what is 10 to the third power? This 3 here lets me know I need three zeros on my number. So this is 1 thousandths. I can keep it as a 1 thousandths if I want, or I can convert this to its decimal equivalent. I need three decimal places because it has to be in the thousandths spot. So this is 0 0.001. 
Then I evaluate 10 to the third, which we've already established is 1,000. So if I have 1,000 and I add 1,000th to it, I have 1,000 and 1,000th. And that is going to be your answer. Negative exponents never mean a negative base. It means an inverse, or not an inverse, a reciprocal base. So how do you find the radius of a circle if given the diameter's value? Well, radius is from the center of a circle out to its circumference. A diameter is the total distance across from one end of the circumference to the other, crossing directly through the middle. So the radius is half of the diameter's value. Okay, so to find the radius, just cut the diameter in half. If you were given the radius and you needed to find the diameter, just double the radius, because then that gets you the total distance across. Just a little fact to know. So this next one, I kind of had fun with making up a pretend animal. Uh, Javier is designing a four-sided pen for his ostrich, Jumanji. And he has 400 feet of fencing to make a, a pen out of, and he wants to give Jumanji as much space as possible, but figures as long as he uses all 400 feet of fencing, it's going to be the same area inside. Is he right or not? This one's kind of hard to tell unless you start proving it. So if I have a four-sided figure and I have 400 feet, I can come up with a couple different options for figuring out total space, all right? So if I had, say I had decided I'm going to make Jumanji just this really long path to run on. I'm only going to make it one foot wide. Okay, one foot wide. All right, so I use up one foot of fencing here, one foot of fencing here, so I'm going to take that out of 400, which leaves me 398. Then I'm going to take 398 and divide that by two to find out how long each side can then be. Well, 199 feet, 199 feet. All right, one plus 199 is 200 feet. I do that twice. So he's got 199 feet to just run. Okay, so what is that as an area? Well. Area is length times width. 1 times 199 means he gets 199 square or square feet. Or we'll just go feet squared. There we go. Great. Doesn't seem like a whole lot. Can we arrange this differently? Let me try some different dimensions. Ooh, what if I divided this up into four equal pieces? That means each side of my perimeter can be 100 feet in length. So let me try this. 100, 100, 100, 100. Well, what is 100 times 100? There's four zeros involved. One, two, three. Ooh, that's 10,000 square feet. Man, Jumanji's going to be really mad if you give him a long run because he's not going to have any space to move around, but he's going to have so much space to move around here. So, the dimensions do matter. And explaining by giving me the evidence, by proving how it matters, is the best way that you can answer this without necessarily having to use words. Because, again, we're multiplying a length, two dimensions. So, the farther those dimensions are apart, or I guess in this case, actually, the closer they are together, Look at how much more space you have than when they're as far apart as possible. So the closer, if you keep even moving in 10, making it 10 by 40, um, yeah, 10 by 40. No, 10 by, I'm not, I'm not figuring it out right now. But anyways, <laughs> all right, that was trying to figure out a 400 square foot area. Um, just adjusting the dimensions a little bit to bring them closer and closer, you'll find a drastic difference and increasing in total area for your ostrich. Okay. We can now use Pythagorean's theorem in order to find the missing leg of our triangle. The shortest leg is called leg A, the longer leg is called leg B, and then the longest leg is called the hypotenuse, or in this case we're referring to it as C. So to find our missing value, we plug in our known ones to be able to solve for our unknown. So if I have a squared 
plus b squared, well, b is 12, I square it, equals c squared is 15 squared. So I start evaluating it. What is 12 squared? So 12, well, I know 12 squared is 144, so let's try what 15 squared is. It's 225. So I have a squared plus 144 equals 225. So I need to, in order to start solving for A, I have to subtract 144 from each side. So when I take 225, I subtract 144, I'm left with 81. So A squared equals 81. Now I need to find its root. What number times itself gets me 81? And we use our square root button. So the square root of A squared is just gonna be A. The square root of 81 is going to be a 9. So A's value, our missing leg A, is going to be 9. Okay, we'll just replace not A with 9. Okay, then we're going to look at this second set of values. My shorter side is A, so I have 4 squared plus B squared equaling 8 squared. 4 squared is 16 plus B squared equals 64. I take away the 16, take away the 16, leaving me with 8, or 8 and 48. Okay, well, I have some number times itself equaling 48. Well, 48 is not a perfect square, so that means that this is going to be a slightly funky number. So we go 48, and then we hit our square root button, and that is going to give me... Instead of B, I'm going to have 6.9, and it says 28, but we're just going to round to the nearest hundreds. So 6.93 would be the measure of leg B. Now we got to find the hypotenuse. All right, so if I have 30 squared plus 40 squared equaling C squared, um, 33 times itself is 9, it's going to be 900, I have to leave 40 times itself is going to be 1600, yep, okay, plus 1600 equals C squared. So when I add these two values up, I get 2500 equaling C squared. I now need to find the square root of each side. This is going to simplify to just C because I've basically divided it by itself, leaves me with 1, and then I know that the perfect square of 25 is 5, so I have a 5 here, and because it was a number divided by itself, I only need one of these zeros, or if you just use your calculator, you would be able to see that it is 500, or 50, so c squared is going to be 50. So just remember, you always have the power of the internet at your disposal to let you see practice videos that help you calculate different areas, uh, perimeters, surface areas, things like that, and be able to calculate in your homework. And then when it comes to the test, just remember you have a scientific calculator using 3.14 for pi whenever you're asked to calculate the volume of something that is circular, and just trust Trust the processes, remember the formulas. The formulas will also be provided in the test, so you don't have to panic about that.